So here we go. Cartel Wives, Chapter 31. Grand Jury and Plea Agreements. Mia. When Peter and Junior agreed to become informants and turn themselves in, they formally and legally admitted they were criminals. This acknowledgement didn't change during their years of proffering, although then they were protected. Anything they said couldn't be used against them in a court of law. Olivia. In order to face indictments, they had to sit in front of a grand jury, which they did from December 2008 to June 2009, during their time at the Chicago MCC. Federal grand juries are typically larger than those in state courts. They can contain anywhere from 16 to 23 jurors. In front of these law-abiding citizens, Junior and Peter were prepared to be 100% truthful, incriminate themselves, and tell on everyone they cared for. They knew they were going to be charged, but for what was still in question. That would depend on the grand jury testimony and the government's thorough investigation to make sure all that they'd said was true. Mia. Peter and Junior had to go in front of a grand jury maybe a dozen times, and it was one of the hardest things they'd endured in the whole course of their cooperation. Standing before the grand jury, they had to read out every criminal act they'd committed while they ran their organization. Every single terrible thing. It made Peter feel awful. He didn't even want me to read his sworn statements, let alone his kids one day in the future. Think about that. They, uh putting all their dirt on the paper, you know what I'm saying? And evidently there's no bodies in there and they still feeling some kind of guilt for the things that they did. Yeah, that's a gut-wrenching situation. Your friends, your enemies, your uh, associates, everybody balled up in one situation. And, and shit, everybody headed to hell. I'm so ashamed, he told me on one Sunday visit. When I turned myself in, I wasn't proud of what I'd done. But at the time, I thought I should be forgiven. Now, I'm not sure anyone should ever forgive me. Olivia. Junior was so nervous before his first grand jury appearance, but he wasn't the only person on edge. The whole thing was such a big deal that before he and Peter walked in, officials cleared the entire court. Even the parking lot was empty. When they entered... Tom was sweating profusely. Apparently, it was a big day for everyone, even the U.S. attorney. Mia. The moment Peter stood in front of the grand jury and stated his name, all those people staring at him in disbelief made him feel humiliated. In the drug world, he felt normal, even respected. Out there, in the open, in a court of law, oh. he felt so vulnerable. Yeah, you're smut to those people. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They look at regular people like they're smut. So I could only imagine what they're looking at a, a, a notorious kingpin like. Like such a criminal that it was hard for him to think straight. Olivia. Tom broke down their whole case, walking the jury through everything. From the very first day they started, when they sold their first 30 kilos to their peak, when they had a $200 billion empire. Then, he let the grand jury ask Junior and Peter questions. Pretty soon, the talk turned personal. Everyone was so intrigued with them. Mia. At one point, someone on the grand jury stopped in the middle of his inquiry, stared at them, and said, are you guys going to write a book or make a movie? Bruh, the story tells itself. Stranger than fiction. You don't even have to embellish for this shit to be dope. And everybody that seems to he hear the story knows it. The person that just asked him that knows it. I know it. Y'all are always telling me in the chat, man, this should be a movie. This should be that. That's it's just obvious, man. It just makes sense. Olivia. Finally, in August 2009, the grand jury considered the testimony, read all the evidence, and handed over the indictments. When Mia and I first read them, we were overwhelmed. 
This is a lot to take in, I said to Mia. Yeah, she answered. Reading everything Junior and Peter did on paper is different than living it every day. Mia. Those indictments were hard pills to swallow. Junior and Peter had always wanted to protect us, so in a lot of ways we'd been shielded from the whole truth of what they did. They never wanted us to worry, so in Mexico they made our lives feel almost normal. Still, we didn't feel lied to. I wonder if I can access, if there's a way to access those grand jury uh, testimonies. Because I'd like to hear what the what the internal struggle is, is about. I mean, they know, you know, the women know they're hustlers. They, the women know they've been hustling. Is it the scale? Is it, you know what I'm saying? Especially when there's no bodies, they ain't torture nobody. They was based, their job was basically to outsmart everybody trying to stop them. Ian in the chat said it should definitely be a movie. It will definitely be a movie. And not very far from now. Uh, a TV show. I mean, Charlie's talked about it a little bit. Let the cat out the bag. Um, uh, Val talked about it a little bit. Let, let a little bit of the cat out the bag. So... I'm confident this thing's going to be a full-blown, you know, TV show success. And we certainly weren't mad at them. Sure, we were disturbed to see everything in print, but we knew that Peter and Junior changing their lives had all been done for us and our children. They'd become the men they promised us they'd be, and that we always knew they were. Olivia. After the indictments were handed over, the U.S. attorneys and Peters and Junior's lawyers set to work on a plea agreement. Plea bargains are essentially contracts that are governed by layers upon layers of statutes, rules, guidelines, Department of Justice policies, and case law. In their plea agreements, Junior and Peter would accept all that they'd been charged with. They'd take responsibility for the distribution, the manufacturing, the trafficking, you name it. Then, they'd agree to a range of years that the judge might sentence them to. And it could be five years or five times that. Hmm. Sounds straightforward, right? It was actually a living hell. It was this complicated, painful process that began June 2012, Four long years after they left Mexico and took two months. Bruh, so that means you go through the, you, you make the decision, you call in, you say, hey, I, I want to give y'all what I got. They say, all right, you're on your own. You got a nine month situation where you're out there on your own, doing it on your own. You finally get snatched up. You come to the other side of the border. They straight put you to work right away. And it's four years later, you still rolling shit up. You still rolling people up. You still giving grand jury testimony. And they still ain't gave you a date. They say, ah, five to 700 years. You know, whatever we decide when we decide it. Mia. Over that whole summer, people were angry. And I don't just mean at each other. They were angry at us. The U.S. attorneys went back and forth with our lawyers. Then our lawyers went back and forth. And not just the U.S. attorneys and the lawyers and the, the streets is mad. There's people out there mad, families out there mad, kids out there mad. Then you got the, the, the knuckleheads that, you know, like run into Val in, in, in a Burger King. He's like, oh, you know, are you snitching on me? Are you snitching on me? They convince him that they're not. Two seconds later, but he's like, all right, can I get some work? Like, bro, you looking to go to jail with Peter and Junior. Both sides were eager to settle, and because of that, our lawyers pressured Junior and Peter. Do you know how many kilos of cocaine you sent into the United States? One of them once asked. Yes, why? Peter asked. Because it was so much that most people would get life in prison. You need to sign this plea agreement. Stop fucking playing games. Most people ain't going to give you what Buddy's going to give you. Most people are going to roll up three or four dudes off the block. These guys gave you the supply chain, top to bottom. Peter was pissed. Why are you scolding us? You're our lawyers. You're supposed to be on our side. Peter and Junior loved their lawyers, and so did we. They'd slaved away for them. Joe especially had been on their side since way before they were on the international stage. Junior and Peter never lost sight of that. 
but everyone in a situation like theirs wants the best deal. Of course they were going to fight. Olivia. I was making calls to David and Joe and his legal team day in and day out, and after weeks of endless conversations, they began to get really frustrated with me. We weren't seeing eye to eye. They were advising us, pleading with Peter and Junior to sign, and we were giving them every reason why they shouldn't. It became a non-stop screaming match. Hmm. Things got so bad that our lawyers grew tired of explaining themselves to me. I stopped getting straight responses, and sometimes I'd just get a one-word answer, which is almost as bad as no answer at all. Mia. I'd have to pass messages from our lawyers to Peter, then relay his questions back to them, because in prison, you don't get special privileges to call your lawyer whenever you want. It has to be a matter of life and death. All this back and forth every day felt endless. There were so many calls, I started to get dizzy every time the phone rang. Olivia. Our lawyers wanted Peter and Junior to sign a plea agreement for 10 to 16 years, but I couldn't comprehend why they should settle for that. I thought they didn't deserve a day more than 10 years after everything they'd done. They'd jeopardized their lives when they worked undercover in Mexico. They'd given the government every major player in the cartels on a silver platter. Bruh. On top of that. They were straight up undercover. They was undercover police, bro. There was nothing more you could ask from them than you would ask from somebody on a payroll that could never get that close. Crazy. They'd voluntarily turned themselves in to serve their time and pay for their crimes. Theirs was the biggest case that had ever touched the Chicago office. Bigger than Al fucking Capone. Alphonse. Plus, their intentions had always been good. Light years more honest than anyone else in the drug trade. I tried to spell this out to our lawyers. In this business, many men use their money and power to hurt and kill people, I said. Our husbands have been robbed, kidnapped, and almost left for dead. And not once have they gone out for revenge or been violent. Doesn't that count for something? Apparently, it didn't. You could have bodied everybody and they'd have still treated you the same way. Crazy. I knew there were hitmen for the mob, with bodies stacked up and hidden away, Facts. who had been offered better deals for cooperating. Facts. These guys were in and out of jail in less than 10 years. I guess that shit only happens in New York City, I thought. Gotta have Cutler as your lawyer. Mia. When things didn't go our way, we assumed the worst. That the government didn't need our husbands as much anymore since Vicente was now cooperating. Whatever was going through their minds, the U.S. attorneys were playing hardball, not budging one inch. They were offering Junior and Peter 10 to 16 years. And that was just what it was going to be. After two months, Peter finally decided to sign his plea agreement. He did so the day before Junior did, and then he appeared in front of the federal judge. Olivia. Unlike civil and criminal cases in state and county courts, federal courts don't use juries to approve plea agreements and determine sentences. Instead, there's one appointed official who reviews them and later decides how many days, weeks, or years a defendant gets. Hmm. In Junior and Peter's case, the judge who was going to decide their fate was the chief judge for the United States Court of the Northern District of Illinois, Ruben Castillo. Ruben! Ruben. Mia. Like Peter and Junior, Judge Castillo had done better than his parents. He'd been born in Chicago to a Puerto Rican mom and a Mexican dad, and was the first member of his family to go to college. When he was appointed by Bill Clinton to the U.S. District Court in 1994, he was the first Latino federal judge in the state of Illinois. Castillo had grown up in a tough neighborhood, and many of his friends ended up in prison. All right, to all my Latinos in the chat, did any of that shit matter? You think he gave them any leniency or... 
gave them any, uh, you know, gave them what, something fair, considering what they went through. I don't think it helps at all. Ruben Castillo probably look at them even worse than, you know, what some other judge would. Olivia. In a lot of ways, he and our husbands were two sides of the same coin. But while one had gone to law school and risen to the highest ranks of his profession, the others had run the most lucrative drug operation in the United States. We all knew that growing up in a bad neighborhood is very different than being raised in a home where you're trained to sell drugs. But still, we all wondered, is what makes them similar and different going to make him sympathetic or repel him? Mia. When Peter walked into the courtroom, Judge Castillo was sitting in his oversized chair, front and center, way up high, looking like he was playing God. The courtroom is built to make you feel intimidated, but Peter was experiencing that and more. I was humiliated, Peter said, but I was ready to apologize. I couldn't believe the destruction I'd caused in my life and the lives of others. I wasn't there, but Peter told me that while Judge Castillo read out his charges, he'd never felt sorrier about anything. He wanted to denounce his whole life right then and there. Still, I wished I could tell the judge one good thing about myself, he told me. But he knew he was fooling himself. The time for defending himself was over. He had to be man enough to stand in front of a judge, feel intense remorse, and accept his fate. Olivia. Junior couldn't imagine being alone, in jail, for 16 years. Our babies and Samantha and Sasha were growing up without him. And the six-year difference he was fighting for determined whether he'd be home before Brandon graduated from high school. Yeah, six years, he might even miss his girls' college graduations. Junior and I love each other enough to get through anything, but it's our kids we worry the most about. And we knew that a few years makes a huge difference in a young child's life. So when our lawyer, David, called me one evening and pleaded with me not to let Junior make the biggest mistake of his life, I didn't know what to think. Do I fight like I always have, or do we just accept it? If there's anything I've learned in my marriage, it's to trust my husband 100%. And so I decided to agree with Junior, whatever he wanted to do. Junior fought to the very last day, right up until the minute the U.S. Marshals flew him to Chicago. Hmm. When he landed, Tom and David were there to greet him. Peter already signed the papers, Junior, David said. <laughs> the U.S. attorney added, and if you don't sign them too... It's possible the judge will rip up the plea agreement, and you'll be looking at life. Everything is leverage with them guys, boy. Everything is leverage. Shout out Old 30 North in the chat said Latino judges are the worst. Yeah, man. It send you away for a long, long time. Junior was shocked and hurt, and he knew he was backed up against the wall. He and his twin brother had always been on the same page, but Peter had gone ahead and signed the papers without telling him. Oh, what? That's a point of contention right there. I don't know if I don't know if that was revealed in Surviving a Chapel. I don't think I remember that. I I might be mistaken. It's been a long time since season one, but wow. Why the hell did my brother do that? He thought to himself. Now I don't have two legs to stand on. Deep down, he realized what had really happened. Peter hadn't done anything wrong, and he'd never meant to catch Junior short. It had just been too hard trying to negotiate through their attorneys. Mm. For the first real time in their lives, at such a critical moment, they hadn't been able to communicate. Mm. They hadn't been able to read each other's minds. Right. As Junior signed his plea agreement, minutes before going in front of the judge, tears fell from his eyes. In a room full of men, all of whom were staring at him at his most vulnerable moment, he felt degraded. Worse, he worried that he was giving up, that he was letting me down. Then, as he stood before Judge Castillo, who was draped in a big, 
black cloak with the United States of America emblem behind him and the stars and stripes beside him, Junior felt the power of the court. When Judge Castillo read him his charges, he fully understood the severity of his crimes and the harm he'd done to society, and he realized, I'm ashamed of the damage that I've caused, and I'm ready to pay for my crimes. It's the right thing to do. Judge Castillo pulled his glasses down, looked my husband in the eye, almost surprised, and said, Mr. Flores, do you understand everything that you're admitting to? Yes, Your Honor, he answered, struggling to get the words out. Accepting responsibility was hard, and listening to all he'd done was painful. Suddenly, he knew he'd done the right thing, and later, he told me as much. Liv, we've been living in this bubble. Hmm. I can't believe everything we did. It sounded so bad. I can't believe I fought with my attorneys and almost lost my deal. I could have spent the rest of my life in prison. I'm so grateful I got the plea agreement I did. I want to read those papers. <laughs> I want to know. Nosy. I want to know. I realize now how severe my case was. I can't believe we were living like that for so long. I'm glad it's over. We're going to get through this. I'm proud of you, I said. Then I added, how are you feeling? Relieved. He looked it. Right then and there, I knew our attorneys had been right. And I felt bad for second-guessing them and giving them such a hard time. They'd had his best interests at heart, and I'd just been so passionate, so determined to have my children grow up with their dad. We'd risk our lives, after all, and our husbands were going to have years and years in prison to think about it. We get to hear their story. We get to hear what's going on with them. There's a hundred other families going through that at that same moment. Do I take this deal? Do I do this? Do I bail out? What do I do? Do I keep my mouth shut? They warned me. Do I, you know, it's, it's just bad all the way around, man. It's bad all the way around, but again, it seems like that game is catered to that. You go in knowing this is what it's going to be. I'm going to be the man eventually, or everything's going to be taken away from me. Somebody's going to rat on me, this, that, or the other. They're going to use it against each other, and everybody ends up where? There or in a, in a box? As rough as it was for them, it was rough for a lot of people. I want to read those transcripts. I want to know or, or what they had to say in the courtroom to the grand jury, you know what I mean? And again, th this platform's always open to anybody that, that was affected by it.